Good morning, church family. Great to uh, be with you again this morning, and we thank the Lord that we can uh, come together and fellowship in this way. It's good to hear lately, uh, this past week particularly, uh, about uh, many who are uh, connecting with one another, uh, whether doing outdoor visits or uh, phone calls, uh, texting, it's all needed. So continue to keep that up. Uh, glad we can meet in this way as we open God's Word together. Looking forward to sharing with you this morning. And I want to mention, uh, you may not know it from where you sit, but uh, Brother Ron Burns has been uh, assisting uh, oftentimes in doing the recording, recording of the services. Uh, so again tonight, we'll look forward to uh, him uh, coming alongside and doing some scripture reading, leading us that way. Hey, let's take time and uh, bow our heads and have a time of prayer. Father, uh, thanking you again for this day. Lord, what a great morning we have. What a great weekend. Uh, Lord, it's great because we know you. And Lord, in the midst of this world that's gone crazy, uh, Lord, we know the one who's the, uh, the God of all peace and God of all comfort. And Lord, today we just bow before you, knowing, Lord, as we open your word, you speak to us by your Holy Spirit. The Lord, meet with us in that way. Stir us up in our homes, wherever we might be today. The Lord, your word might be going forth not only to other places, but Lord, in our own hearts and in our own homes. Uh, Lord, do a work in us as only you can do. Uh, use our lips to proclaim your truth. And Lord, may we grow in it and know it in a greater way. Uh, Lord, encourage us to that end this day. I'd ask and pray. Amen. Amen. Brother Ron? Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to be reading um, Psalm 60, 63, 1 through 7. And you can follow along in your Bibles, but I'm going to be reading from the uh, Christian Standard Bible, the Holman Bible. So if you'll follow along, please. That's uh, Psalm 63, 1 through 7. God, you are my God. I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you, my body faints for you in a land that is dry, desolate, and without water. So I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory. My lips will glorify you because your faithful love is better than life. So I will bless you as long as I live. At your name I will lift up my hands. You satisfy me with your rich food my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I think of you as I lie on my bed, I meditate on you during the night, watches because you are my helper. God bless the reading of the scriptures. Thank you, Ron. And uh, once again, we want to uh, continue our study uh, uh, this morning uh, on the tyrants of time. And as we look at our, our study together, uh, we're reminded of the fact that uh, God is alive. His word goes forth. And for you and I, that means that we can put our faith and our hope, our trust in the Lord, trust in his word, we know from our previous studies that God's word shall never change, that God's word is alive, it's powerful, it's able to work in the hearts and lives of men and women today as it has since the day God spoke it. And uh, so we can put great confidence in the word of God. Uh, in our last study, we took time together to uh, understand, to look at the fact that the greatest tyrant of all uh, the first tyrant in the sense of making war in the word uh, is none other than Satan himself. And, uh, and he has uh, declared war upon God and upon God's people against God's word. And in doing so, uh, since the Garden of Eden, uh, Satan has continued with his uh, unholy workers, uh, with his satanic host, they have continued their uh, attacks upon the word of God throughout all of human history. And it's happening today. We see it all around us, and that might become evident as we 
uh, think about and, and, and talk about the scriptures. Ever since the garden, 5,000 plus years now, uh, as we said, Satan has been at work with his army. He's been at work in this world to corrupt the word of God. And even today, there are so many uh, attempts at changing the word of God, at disarming it, dismantling it. And that's all the work of Satan and his uh, tyrants uh, today. We get to the New Testament. That's more our focus today. There's so much. I, I can only have a, a bite-sized meal of the truth with you in that sense. But as we look into the New Testament, we find very quickly in the book of Acts that, that as young as the church was, and the day of Pentecost onward, as young as the church was, uh, Satan very quickly moved in and planted weeds, or, or shall I say seeds of weeds, right within the church. Uh, seeds of evil, seeds of lies, uh, right into uh, the, the church that was born and begun in those days, so that even in the earliest of days, the church was already combating against false teaching uh, within the church. Uh, just a few thoughts as we enter this year. I thought of the words of the Lord Jesus. Jesus understood this. He said in Matthew 24, 24, when the disciples asked, Lord, when shall these things be? They were looking forward to the coming kingdom. And Jesus answered them in verse 24, or chapter 24. He said this, for false Christs, false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So Jesus was very aware that in the early days, the time uh, just ahead, because we find the term last days or the last days of the scripture, it doesn't only make reference to the things that are ahead from where we sit, uh, but that encompasses the period of time from the time of Christ until the time of Christ's return. We could really put the parentheses between Christ's first coming and his second coming. Those were the last days, as the writers of the New Testament put it. And Christ said, when these days unfold, there will be people rising up saying, I'm Christ, follow me. Christ is there, Christ is there. And there'll be false uh, prophets. Again, the people of Israel were very aware of the prophets of God, but he again gave warning that false prophets would rise up and come with a message. That message would not be from God. False prophets are not from God. They're from the devil. And they, they work for that tyrant. The Apostle Paul warned the Corinthians when he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 and 14, he, he said, Such are false a prophet, false prophets and, and, and deceitful, false apostles, excuse me, and deceitful workers. These false prof, uh, false uh, apostles, it's Another way of looking at that, they're the super apostles, Paul was saying. These guys who claim to be everything, these deceitful workers uh, that were already at work in the church, he said they're transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. They're false apostles, but they come forth looking like, because of the things they say and the way they look and the powers they claim, they appear to be even so the apostle of Christ. They transform themselves into it. They look just like the real thing. And then Paul goes on to say this, And little wonder, no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. And if Satan can appear as a minister of righteousness, an angel of light, then don't be surprised that his evil, deceitful workers likewise come looking like they are proclaimers of light, that they know the truth. I think of the cults all around us, and every particular cult claims it, carry its own light, and they're in darkness, and they're in darkness. And so we come back again to the teaching of God's Word. As we survey the New Testament, one thing becomes very evident, and I think it was impressive to my own heart and mind as I studied this, and it's that much of the New Testament is written to give warning to the church, to the Christian, concerning the reality of false teaching, false teachers. Much of it was written that way. We read some scriptures already. Uh, Paul wrote the entire book of Galatians. 
uh, to warn against Judaizers of the day. Uh, John, uh, the Apostle John, writes in his epistles about the Antichrists that are already at work in the world today. And then again, we find Jude. Jude himself writes about deceivers. Peter writes about it. And not only once, but again and again. Paul writes it to the, in the pastoral epistles. He, he writes warning about it and those who would come in. And Paul's not afraid to recognize those that are known to be such, and he names them. Friends, one thing for sure, we ought to be able to recognize, recognize and identify those who are particularly peddling the, the, the lives of the devil. And uh, we need to recognize that in, in the day in which we live in. One of the reasons is this, because we live in a day when the media platform, social media, our, our own radios and our cars, uh, our, our television uh, that we have, the religious channels, uh, we are literally being bombarded and the plate is filled to overflowing with false teaching in the day we're living in. Think about that for a minute. There's never been a time in history when Satan has just filled up the prince and power of the air, has filled up the airways with false teaching. The result of it is the, those that are lost and without Christ have no idea oftentimes of how to find the truth about salvation, about heaven. Because the true preacher preaches and, and it's an evangelistic message or it's an expositional, a teaching message. And people today have so many conflicting reports. When they try to hear the truth, it's hard because so many voices are claiming the truth. I was reading a, a, a cult website this week to, to just see what they said about uh, their truth and, and, and what, they, what they speak. And what they do not tell you is what to stay allegiant to the Word of God. Uh, they tell you to stay allegiant to the revelation as it's given by their man, by their elders. And, uh, and, and if you violate that, then you, you completely leave the truth. Friends, we don't find that in the Word of God. We don't follow the, the words of a, a man. We follow the Word of God, the Word of truth as it is. And uh, we've been looking at that and we'll continue to preach that as long as the Lord gives us breath. But the problem today of false teachers is, as I said, it's, it's, it's a magnitude kind of problem. Uh, it, there, it literally is a pandemic problem in, in the fact that there's so much out there to confuse people that want to know the truth. Don't be afraid to share the truth with those around you because it's very rare they might hear the truth of God's word as you might claim it. I had a privilege today with a large group at a, at, at a, a graveside service, a wonderful time, wonderful folks there. Uh, but I was very clear about one thing. There, there are not many ways to heaven. Jesus is the only way. And through forgiveness of sins, we can be there. No other way. Oh, there are so many other voices calling out today, trying to declare uh, their own message on getting uh, to God's heaven. One great problem today uh, that we have is the fact that we as God's people in the church, likewise, have never had a time when there is so much knowledge, good knowledge, truthful preaching before us. It's an overabundance of it. If you have a question, uh, you can just put that out there and, and get the answer. We know uh, a few weeks ago, uh, the Graham Association uh, uh, published a testimony of a police officer who has just had it with the world and wanted to know how he could be saved. And so he Googled that and found the answer. He was directed, I think I shared that already, to Billy Graham uh, Association and made a decision to come to Christ. Now, friends, there's, there's a lot that we can learn if you're a student of the Bible and you, you, you're getting into your studies, you can get all kinds of help right there on the internet today. More than any other teacher or preacher has had. Uh, uh, the previous, my pastor, uh, MBBI grad some years ago, 
Uh, I remember looking at his library after I was here pastoring, and, and I've got a, a pretty good-sized library, I think, uh, here uh, on the Internet, but on, on the uh, Logos Bible software, but uh, likewise on my shelves. And this fellow came out of school in the 50s, and he had a, a very narrow uh, assortment of books. He just went to the Lord. He looked into the Word, learned to study that way. And God blessed him and blessed his ministry. Friends, I'm saying it this way. We have a super abundance of knowledge at our disposal today. But with that being said, listen now. I've never seen a day when God's people, generally speaking, Christians, are more confused about what the Bible has to say. More confused about it. And because Christians can be confused about the basic issues of the faith, they lack confidence in the reality of the truth of the Word of God. Confidence about the fact that this is God's holy book. That it has absolute truth, not relative truth. We don't decide what is true and not true. The culture doesn't decide it. God has declared it. Do we believe that this Bible is absolutely true? Do we believe in God? What do we believe about God? That's declared in his book. What do we know about Jesus Christ? Who he is? What he's done? What do we know about his, his history? What do we know about his creative work? What do we know about his coming to earth? What do we know about his sinlessness? What do we know about his sacrifice? What do we know about the substitutionary death and that Christ died for mankind? We, what do we know about the satisfaction of Christ's death from the Father's perspective? What do we know about his second coming? All of these things ought to be things that every Christian ought to understand and be, be able to articulate in the world in which we live. But rather than becoming bold and confident in God's word, even Christians seem a bit fearful to be too bold about what they believe. Friends, this is a matter of concern, not only in the church, but particularly in the area of false teaching. Think about that now with me. If by and large, Christians today, rather than being confident in what the teaching of God's word is, they are confused. How are they positioned to deal then with false teaching that is literally pouring out of the airwaves on, on, on the television? And the cults are at work. They're, they're, they're going door to door at times. Now they're, going, uh, they're making their phone calls. Uh, they're making their internet connections. I, I, I appreciate their, their uh, passion. But friends, what are we doing is the question. How are we getting God's word out? Are we anxious to do so? Uh, but we'll never be anxious to do so if we don't understand it ourselves. So the message I get out of this study today as we look this morning in God's word is this. Am I learning God's word? Do I know what I believe? Do you know what you believe? Can you articulate it? Can you, can you tell people what you believe about the Bible? What you believe about God? What we believe about Jesus Christ? What you believe about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in relation to uh, Pentecostalism? What do you believe about the Holy Spirit? What is his ministry on earth today? What is his ministry in the church? What do you believe about the end times? What do you believe about the second coming? About the rapture of the church being raptured up to heaven? What do you believe about the end times, the book of Revelation, when the church will be gone, but, but literally all hell will break loose on earth, that great tribulation period? What we believe on that ought not to come from the preacher. It ought not come from the radio. It ought to come from the Word of God. Thus we have again, God's Word is not bound. When people understand it and know it, God is able to use it in our lives and through us in the world in which we live. So today, I want to just take a snapshot. I said a small a slice of truth out of the New Testament pertaining to these false teachers. And it's, it's small, 
uh, but it's full. And, uh, and it really is a reflection of much of the other teaching, but there certainly is much more to be added. So this morning in our study, would you turn with me please to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, down near the end of the Bible. 2 Peter chapter 2. Now, most of us as Christians uh, are probably more familiar with chapter 1 for two reasons. Peter boldly declares two wonderful truths in chapter 1. He, he, he declares the truth about the new nature of the child of God. We are partakers of God's new nature, the divine life. Secondly, uh, he does this. Having said that, he establishes the foundation that the God promises of God are given to us upon, and that foundation is none other than the Word of God. If you're going to understand error, false teaching, then you'll never, then you must have a concrete understanding of what this book. We hold in our hands, in our hide in our hearts, what this book truly is. I need, to, I need to look at the end of chapter 1 with you, and then some of you will say, oh yeah, there we are, understanding the, the, the context of the study. He ends having spoken about the fact that the prophets of old, the Old Testament prophets, that God spoke to, that wrote down the word of God, and, and, and he's saying to them, these true holy prophets of the Old Testament they received by divine revelation the truth of God and by spirit uh, inspiration they wrote what God said in the book. That's the word of God. And, and he says in verse 21, Peter writes this, for the prophecy, the Old Testament writings, the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Jeremiah didn't say, you know what, I feel like I'm inspired today. I think I'll write down some scriptures, some inspirational words. Not in that sense. Jeremiah heard from God, as did the other prophets, and he spoke what God gave him. We looked last week at the fact that he told his secretary to write the words that God had given him. And that's what the prophets did. They received God's word. They were called by God. They received God's word, and they wrote God's word down. Now, friends, that is the foundation for our faith. That's the foundation for what I believe. That's the foundation of my belief in salvation today, in Christian living for today. And, and even so, it's the foundation, this word of God, for everything that I believe about the future, uh, particularly uh, what God's going to do in the days ahead, but particularly in heaven uh, by way of the fullness of my own salvation and ours as well. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God. Notice that. What kind of men? Holy men of God. They spoke as they were moved or directed, overseen by the Holy Spirit. Now that is the foundation that everything in chapter 1 rests upon. You can go back and read chapter 1. Uh, you want to do that. We're, we're partakers of the divine nature that we receive at the time we get saved, at the time of salvation. But what we believe is what holy men of God received directly from God, and by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they penned those very words. That is what our faith is is established on. On what? The Word of God. The Word of God. And he calls it here before that in verse 19, we have a more solid word of prophecy. Friends, don't back down when it comes to those who claim their own message. Our message is God's message. Every other message is a lie. All other teaching is not truth. We hold and have God's truth. The Christian truth is exclusive 
It's not tolerant of all faiths and all beliefs. In that sense, the Christianity is intolerant in the fact that it does not accept the fact that everybody's belief is equally true. This Bible is exclusively the Holy Word of God. Now, having said that, Peter moves them from the thought of the holy men of God, holy prophets of God that wrote his more sure word of prophecy for us. And he moves now to the area of false teaching. We have the truth, but there are those who bring in a mixture of truth and false teaching. And they put them together and they shake them up and they come out with their own brand of religion. Now I would say to you, it's a good exercise, look on a website, you go on a website for a, a cult that you might know of, some other religion, and you begin to read and see how different it is, how different their faith is. Some things seem the same. The language might seem the same, but it's not the same at all when you compare it to the more sure word of prophecy. So Peter begins, and here's our verses today, just two verses, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Peter writes this, But there were false prophets also among the people. He's looking back to the Old Testament. That's what he's been discussing, the prophets of old. And he says, there were false prophets also among the people. We could add the people of the Old Testament. The people of prior ages. There were false prophets there. Remember, primarily in the Old Testament, a prophet was one who received word from God and spoke a message on God's behalf. They spoke God's message. Now, he goes on to say this. Let me read through. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily or secretly shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought, bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow after their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. The way of truth is spoken evil of because of these people, not because of the Christians, but because of the false teachers and the false teaching. I have a brief outline here. I want to look at three things with you here that, that kind of come out of the passage. I want to look first of all at these false teachers. I want to look at their duplicity. I want to look secondly at their doctrine. Every false teacher comes with his or her own doctrine, teaching, instruction. Not only the, the duplicity, not only their doctrines, but one thing for sure Peter mentions, we'll look at it here, is their destruction. It said it here, their swift destruction. We could say it this way, their swift and sure destruction. Well, let's begin looking at their, I wrote it this way, their subtle duplicity. Duplicity, with another word we could use, is hypocrisy. They look religious, they're religious, they look righteous, but they're not righteous. People can be religious, but not be of God. I don't know, do you, how many religions there are in the world? Google that one. It's growing by leaps and bounds. Ravi Zacharias, uh, some time ago, uh, uh, some years ago, wrote a book about the, called The Kingdom of Counts. And uh, within a number of years, a short number of years, uh, he wrote that book again. Uh, because so many more cults have just sprouted up around the world. All having their variations. Same with the churches. Yeah. Our church, a Bible-believing church, by that I mean the church of God, Jesus Christ in this world. How many other churches are there, different brands today? I'm not talking Protestant denominations. I'm talking about different kinds of churches. Friends, the church of Jesus Christ the church he purchased with his own blood. That's the only church that matters to God. You can hang any shingle you want out front, but, but you must be under the umbrella of God's truth, his word, in order to be God's church. Well, 
having understood the fact that we have the sure word of prophecy, the word of truth from God, we understand that there are those who will say they have truth that speak with forked tongue, if I can say it that way. That they say one thing, but they, they mean another. Uh, let's look at the word here. He says, first of all, there were false prophets. Uh, the, the language there suggests that they, there were some who rose up, is the thought there. In the Old Testament days, there were some who rose up to be false prophets. They were not called of God. They did not receive revelation from God. Rather, they're self-appointed. We could go back again, 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 and again, and, and prove that out of the Old Testament. How many rose up? And they were enemies of the gospel, the enemies of God, that is. They were in opposition to truth. And yet they stand and declared their own ways. Not God's ways, but their own ways. And uh, here we have it. They, they rose up. They were, the word there is a, a pseudo prophetess. Pseudo prophetes. That's the word. They were pseudo. They weren't real. They were self appointed. The, as the word is in the English here, they were false. And not only were there false prophets of old, but, uh, uh, but even as there what? Uh, shall be. Uh, Peter's looking ahead. He knows what's to come. He's been preaching the truth, teaching the truth. And he knows that after his time, grievous wolves, as Paul told the leaders of Ephesus, grievous wolves will, will come in amongst them, rise up from among the fellowship. Uh, they'll come in wearing sheep's clothing, looking like one of us. Uh, but, but soon enough, that masquerade will be over and, and, and they'll be revealed uh, by what they say and what they teach. And, and their doctrines uh, and their teaching will be for one purpose, that they might slaughter uh, the sheep, the true sheep of God. And that's their, uh, it's called here damnable heresies. That's what they're after. Uh, so who are they? They're false prophets and false teaching. That's pseudo didascalia, uh, the ministry of teaching. That just means teacher. But here they're, they're, they're designated to be pseudo, they're false teachers. In, in, in contrast to true teachers, these men, these women are false teachers. I could certainly name uh, some, even some lady uh, uh, false teachers today, false preachers. If you see a lady who's preaching, I would suggest you be careful there right away. Why? Because it's contrary to the teaching of God's Word, the teaching ministry. Now, ladies have a teaching ministry uh, within the church. That's certainly fine. But when they run the ministry and they run a church, uh, friends, that's, uh, that, that is not God's way. And uh, well, that's another message for another time. But, but they're false teachers. They stand up. They open up the book. They claim a message. They sound good. They look good. They say, hey, what's the difference? When you're asking yourself that, Christian, you're recognizing one thing. They're deceptive in their ways because they appear to teach the same thing that we might teach even here in this pulpit. We need to know the truth, don't we? They're false. Paul writes to Timothy about the, the dangerous days, the perilous days, the, the last days that are coming. And one of the characteristics of those days is that people have a form of godliness. They have religion. They have programs. They have buildings. They have money coming in. They have expensive stuff to work with. They have what looks to be the makings of a great worldwide ministry as Paul calls them super apostles they have a form of godliness but it's empty religion empty by way of God being in it he's not in it Paul says he writes to Timothy beware of those who have a form of godliness but deny the power of it the Spirit of God is not in it. He's not in them. He's not in their work. Oh, what they do may look good. A lot of it may be good. But if it's not from God, friend, it's from the devil. And uh, that's the perspective of Scripture. Well, let's look on here. That's who they are. They're false teachers. That's who they are. Uh, let's look secondly at what they do. This duplicity is seen in what they do. 
Notice right away the first characteristic that Peter gives us here uh, this morning as we look at this. Uh, there shall be false teachers among you. Where's that? In the church. He's writing here to the churches. And, and, and he says, among you. We don't expect that the wicked one's going to stay out there, do we? Jesus warned, and Paul warned, and here Peter's warning, there'll be some who will rise up in your midst. We've got such a great church family, I, I sometimes have to remind myself, don't be, don't be lulled to sleep, because the wicked one would love to come in and sow evil seeds, even amongst our midst, our church. But that's what they do. There should be false teachers among you. Here's the word. Who privily, or some of, our, some of your versions will have, who secretly bring in damnable heresies. The word is used two, uh, I think three times in these two verses. That word damnable, New King James, you have it there. You probably have it there as well. Uh, Ron has the word destructive. Huh? Destructive, you've got that. And that's a, a proper translation. It really is the thought of being destructive. Uh, that's what they are. It's destructive teaching. But how do they bring destructive teaching into a church like this? Have you ever had a Christian friend who's just gone off the wall following error? I surely have. I have a very good friend over the years who we enjoyed great fellowship with, we vacation with. And in time... They became preoccupied with the books that didn't make it into this Holy Bible. They weren't accepted as part of the canon. And they really began to believe that those books held secrets that this book was keeping from us. And all being said, that family left their church. They left the Word of God for these other pursuits. They left the church. They left their Christian friends. That was pretty much the end of it. I've loved them, but friends, they were sadly and sorely wrong. How does something like, something like that happen to a good Christian couple, to a family like that? Friends, I know how it happens because false teachers, now where did that come from? Their false teaching came from the internet. Their false teaching came from broadcasts of the radio that were being made and the false teacher was only too willing to mail them the material that taught the last days were upon us and they better join that group and get ready or they wouldn't be prepared when everything broke loose down here. Well, for many reasons, the teaching of that man was sorely wrong. Yes, we tried to share it with him. We tried to discuss the Word of God. But by that time, the evil teaching had already blinded their minds, it seems. To the truth of God's word. It's sad, but that's what happens. They secretly come in. Jude writes it this way, for certain men, Jude 4, for certain men have crept in, King, uh, New King James has unnoticed. Uh, King James, they've crept in unawares. What's that mean? Well, they come through the door holding a Bible, uh, you, you look at them as they're sitting in your midst and, hey, they're singing the words. They know the words of the songs. They're friendly. They come to church suppers. They seem to be just like we are. And so they come in. Then they enter a Bible study. Maybe the lady goes to a, a ladies' Bible study. Maybe uh, the, if it was a man, he'd, he'd attend the small group Bible study. And there in that little group, they begin in a very, very crafty way. That's the way, remember last week, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, Satan was the most subtle, the most crafty of all beasts. He was the deceiver of all, all deceivers. And, and that person comes in and they, they have their own agenda. You can't see it because you think they think like we do. And they come in and they begin, whether it's with one person or a small group or even in time before a larger group, Maybe they could get into a teaching ministry with children. Maybe they could get into home visits. Friends, we need to be careful today that we understand who we're dealing with and what they believe before we embrace them too quickly. 
And I find in a small church like ours, that's just what we don't want to do. <laughs> we like to be a loving church. We like to be an accepting church. But, but be careful, be careful, because the devil is at work. And he would love to get in. And, and the way to fight that, we'll talk about that, the way to combat such error like that is for every member to be grounded. That's the way to combat it. So whether they're in a big group or whether they were in a small group, those in that group understand that they have spiritual discernment, their antennas are up, so that when someone tries to teach something, present something that is not from God, that is not in line with His Word, that there are many men and women, and I'm thankful for our, our leadership, uh, even for those who aren't appointed leaders and have grown in Christ's Word, uh, that they're well able uh, to, to handle those situations. And that's one of the things we try to see to it here when we have other ministries that, that, that kind of uh, happen outside of the uh, structured services, that is. Uh, but even in those times, we have people that are able uh, to handle those kinds of things and to face those kinds of challenges. Why? Because... Uh, they, they come in. How they come in is they come in deceitfully. They come in secretly. They come in appearing to be, appearing to be men or women of truth when indeed they're sent from the devil. They're sent on a mission. And their mission, we'll see in a moment here, is, is not good. Um, and that's what we have here. Well, the duplicity isn't only in, in who they are. They're false teachers. It isn't only on their manner of living. They, they, they look nice, they smile, they sing. They may even know the Bible better than you, better than I. I had a chance a short while ago to engage someone. I'll tell you, uh, even the cults know their Bible, often far better than we do. But that may not be the measuring stick. They don't know the truth. They know a lot, but not necessarily. Are they confident and bold in the truth? Don't ever feel like you need to Measure up, friends. You can always get help. We had a fellow who lived just beyond me, and every time a cultist would come to his door, and they were coming often in those days, he'd call me at the church here, and I'd go down. And they finally gave up. We, we crossed swords for a while, and, and I was looking forward to those visits and, and meeting up with him at this uh, Christian man's house, but he'd never grown to the Lord, and he did like uh, uh, being rude, and I would mind sitting down and showing the people what the Word of God had to say, and needless to say, they didn't visit his home uh, for too long. I enjoyed a few of those visits, but uh, it was good to do that. But uh, Let's look thirdly here at, at the duplicity, the hypocrisy, uh, and, and see what it is. Uh, I say duplicity because these men, if they're teachers of the Word of God, they ought to be what kind of men? What kind of women? They're like the ones in chapter 1 we looked at. They ought to be holy men, holy women. That's what they ought to be. And, uh, and instead... These teachers, it's not designating whether the teachers ought to be male or female. They could be either one. They are false teachers. But these teachers are this. They are immoral in their conduct. They are immoral in their behavior. Friends, I can't underscore this one any more than Scripture does. Uh, it, it lays a lot of weight on the character of these men and women. The reality is, without the power of God, the gospel, the grace of God, at work in our lives, we too would be corrupt men and women, right? The old man, the old nature is corrupt. And but by the grace and the power of God at work in us, we would continue in those corrupted ways. These false teachers do not have the power of God, the Holy Spirit, working in their lives. Therefore, although they appear to be religious, they continue in their sinful ways. Now we see that here uh, as we look at the study in verse 2. Look at verse, verse 2 with me. And many followers, many shall follow their, like here's that word again, destructive or pernicious ways. This is one time, I think in context, the King James really gets the point. The New King James has destructive ways. That's in keeping with the context for sure. But the thought in verse 2 lends itself truly, and the word used here, 
lends itself truly to the King James choice, again an archaic word, uh, the word pernicious ways. People follow them in their pernicious ways. What in the world does that mean? <laughs> pernicious. We have it here. Uh, it, it, the ESV translates it well. Uh, sensuality. That's the word. Uh, and again, I could well use the word uh, immorality. The Greek word means this. Unbridled lust, excessive passion, and shamelessness. These people will do the grossest kinds of sins and not think about it. How in the world can people that are in high positions or supposedly religious positions give themselves to such a moral living? Because that's who they are. They're immoral in their living. And many, catch it now, we'll come back, many follow it. I say the sense of the verse is really in their pernicious or their, their sensual living because they're sensual in all ways. They, they're fleshly in their approach to ministry. Their, their desire is, is for filthy uh, gain. They want money. Uh, their, their belly is their greed. They're, they're doing it for the sake of pride. That's why they're doing what they do. They, 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 work, for the, uh, the, they work for the evil one, the, the one who keeps men blind. And by their teaching, they keep the lost man lost. They keep the saved man confused. And so again, we find them uh, doing their own thing. Look what it says at the end of the verse here. By reason of whom? Who? These false teachers. By reason of whom? False teachers who live immoral lives. They live, live sinful lives. How can you tell a false teacher is a false teacher? Look behind the camera. Look at their personal living. How many jets do they have parked at their house? How many mansions do they have? How many fancy cars do they drive? What kind of paycheck do they bring home? Friends, I will tell you, much of this marks out their sensual living. The other scriptures in the New Testament uh, verify uh, that. Uh, but by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. If they appear to be religious and they live like the devil, people will say what? You know what? All religion is a lie. Won't they? That's what they'll do. The way of truth, the word there is literally to be blasphemed. It will be reproached in the world. Friends, many times we have a hard time speaking the truth to a dear friend or a family member because they have a sour taste in their mouths from what they've seen in false religions in the world. And that's one of the deceptions of the evil one again. That's one of the deceptions of the evil one. Let's look next here. Uh, we've got to move real quick, but uh, let's look next this morning at their doctrine. Not much said here, but there's much said afterwards. It's, it's referenced in two ways here. Uh, these ones who sneak in they shall bring in damnable or destructive heresies, lies. What that word bring in means this. It means they take the Bible and they lay their truth beside it. Their book of truth beside it. They don't deny the Bible altogether, outwardly, but they lay their book beside it as if that book is on par with God's book. It is not. This is the only truth of God in the world. And the wording there means simply that they come in and they open their Bible. Hath God said, as Satan did with Eve. They take the truth of God and they lay a lie upon it. Like painting a red room with white paint. Or the vice versa. Uh, but they, they, they put one lie upon another lie and another lie against the Word of God until people no longer believe, understand the truth. Those are damnable heresies. Now, Peter just makes one more conclusive mark, uh, remark concerning the doctrine. We see that here this morning. He says this, even, 
Could I add it this way? Even to the point, or the gall of these teachers who dare, dare, do what? Notice it here. Deny the Lord that bought them. Speaking about the work of Christ on the cross on Calvary. They deny the work of Jesus Christ who bought them. Friends, you ever want to cross sword with any false teacher, you, you want to talk with them that way, you know who Christ is and you do, you do discussion with them in that area. Who do you say that I am, Jesus asked. What a religion says about Jesus Christ determines who they are and where they're from. The primary deceitful method of every cult is to teach another gospel concerning Jesus Christ. The language here very clearly, they even, the goal of them, they even deny the Lord that bought them. That word bought is one of three Greek words in the New Testament. It means this. We could read it very clearly. It means this. Denying the Lord that redeemed them. He died to redeem them. That's the thought here. They may deny the death. They might, may deny, like Catholicism, that Christ died once for all. Because Catholics believe in transubstantiation, where when they take the Eucharist, that, that the Christ died again. They literally uh, re-crucify him every week. No, dear friends, Hebrews 10 teaches it clearly. Christ was a single sacrifice who died once for all time. That's the teaching of the Bible. You see how we differ? Religion upon religion. What does it believe about the death of Jesus Christ, the substitutionary death, the atonement of Christ, the blood of Christ being shed, and what that accomplishes in the life of a man or woman? Friends, Christianity stands head and shoulders above every false teacher. And there's enough there to discern whether or not someone's following after the same Christ we follow after. That's why Paul said they follow another gospel. The Judaizers, not the one we follow after. He said you remove from Christ. Don't allow that to happen. Settle yourselves. And when I talk with people that come from another faith or another religion, Friends, I get right to Jesus Christ and I want to know what they think about Christ because we'll part ways right there. We don't need to argue about much else uh, because that's what they do. They, they bring in their destructive, their damnable teaching and, 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 and it not only brings destruction to them but to others as well. That's our last point uh, this morning. The last point this morning is this. Their undeniable destruction. We looked at their duplicity, their doctrines, they're from the evil one. We could spend much more time there. And lastly, their destruction. Peter takes from here, uh, this area, right down to verse 9, and even on into the next chapter, talking about this matter of destruction. We need to understand this. We're not talking here about well-meaning Christians who are undertaught concerning the truth. We're talking about the tyrants that are in league and in line with the evil one. Those, those who are deceitful workers. They work with, they work for Satan. They don't peddle the truth. They sell it off. A Judas teacher in that sense. There's a twofold destruction we find here. At the end of verse 1, those who even would teach the, those damnable doctrines, it says here, and I'm using that word particularly because we need to understand the effect of those doctrines and those who believe in them. The end of verse 1 it says, and, and, and bring themselves swift destruction. Mark that. Where is their teaching going to lead them? Where does it lead them? Where does it appoint them? It appoints for them swift destruction. Friends, today they may have the cameras rolling, they may have the lights shining, they may have uh, fat pockets and fancy cars and all the rest of it, but I want you to know something, there is good is dead already. Their destructive, their, their, their destruction is already determined by God himself. That is the conclusion if you read down through to verse 9. He, he gives example after example of the, the angels who sinned. They're going to be destroyed forever. God's determined that already. They're already appointed to destruction. That's the thought of that word swift. 
It could mean the word sure. It's not that they might be wrong, that they might get into heaven. No, friend, their portion is the portion with the devil. Because they've rejected God's truth, God has already rejected everyone who does not exclusively follow God's word. Now, there's a lot I've given you there, but we need to understand that there's swift destruction appointed for them. And again, Peter gives that to us in the next chapter. Those who challenge and mock, scoff at the Bible and the teaching of the Bible, friends, their destruction is sure. The destruction of this world is coming. The end times with fire. And the destruction of those who teach Satan's doctrine, they also will be destroyed with them. But sadly enough, not only shall they be destroyed, but verse 2 says what? Many shall what? Follow them. Many shall follow them. That's what the Bible teaches. That many will follow them, but they'll follow them to a destination. The idea there is to follow them to a destination. Uh, the word to follow carries with it the idea of walking a path. To go to a choice place. You set your GPS on a destination and you follow the road. If you get on the road, which is the word here, the way, the path, with the false teachers, where are you going to end up? The Word of God says you're going to end up with them in destruction. You go to Revelation 20, where's Satan, where's Satan going to end up? In the lake of fire, 2010, forever and ever and ever. He's tormented there. Where will those that come before Christ at the great white throne judgment, and their names are not found in the book of life, where will every one, small and great, where will they end up? They'll end up in the lake of fire, which burneth forever and ever and ever. That's the second to the final death. Dear friends, we as God's people ought to do three things. We need to believe God's word. We need to believe God's word. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show yourself approved unto God. If you come to this church, friends, I want to encourage you take this time home and, and, and get to understanding God's word. Can you, can you write it out what you believe about the Bible, about God, about Satan? about man, about sin, about salvation, about eternal life? Can you write about those things, future events? Friends, those are things we ought to know. We, first of all, ought to be studying the Bible, know what we believe. Secondly, as you're doing right now, we need to receive the Word of God from true teachers of truth. Amen? There are many good places to do that. We need to read good books by good teachers and, and be careful. Don't take everything that's on the radio. Be careful who you learn from. But friends, as you learn the Word of God, take it in. The, the Berean Christians, they, they, they took the Word of God with readiness of mind, and they searched the Scriptures daily to see whether or not these things were true. We don't do my heart well to think you sat at home, or you took it upon yourself this week to look, look up the words uh, false teachers, and, and, and went through the New Testament and did your own study. You say, wow, you only... You only Touched on the tip of the iceberg. Those guys are bad dudes. That's right, they are. They are. They're liars. And, 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 and there's a price that they'll pay for that. Friends, I, we need to be bold about understanding that. They're not like we are. No, dear friends. And then lastly, I think this. Peter writes about it here. 1 Peter 3.15. Peter writes this. Be ready to give an answer, a defense, to everyone who asks you the hope that's within you. Hey, what if you talked about somebody who was going the wrong way, believed the wrong way? They've been listening to lies, and they didn't know the truth. Friends, could you know that, would you know the truth enough to say, hey, let me tell you what the Bible has to say about our sinfulness. Let me tell you about what the Bible has to say of how you need to be saved, how all men need to be saved through Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what the Bible has to say about our sin, even after we're Christians. Friends, be ready to give a good defense, a good answer. Don't argue with people, but, but help them to see, be a teacher of what? A, a teacher of the truth, a teacher of the word. We desperately need to know God's word ourselves. And the world desperately needs to have people 
in our churches that are versed in the word and can help them come out of the confusion and see the clarity of God's truth. Let's pray. Thanks for joining uh, with us this morning. And I pray God will strengthen your heart and encourage you and I both to, uh, to, to make our travel to God's heaven uh, in a way that uh, we'll, we'll be able to well represent who the Lord is in knowing his word and knowing him through it. Father, thank you again for our time this morning. Thank you for the things we've been able to glean and look at. Lord, help us to be alert to the false things around us. But Lord, also help us to be alive to the word of God. Help us to learn it, to know it, to love it, and to speak it. May the Spirit of God help us to that end. I'd ask and pray. Amen. God bless. See you next time.